And one of the guys who lived in the tribe mm. asked my buddy, uh, he goes, so how many wives do you have? Mm -hmm. And he goes, oh yeah, I only got, I got one. Mm -hmm. And the guy just starts like, feeling so bad for him like <laughs> oh my god poor guy be like zane That's what's wrong. going yeah, on yeah, yeah. like you're acting like you have all these things but you're going to class and then we're giving you this test and you're passing it yeah and i realized i just wasn't into it mm. so fast forward i turned 14 years old and i started yeah. selling so that's nice. Let's go. My first thing. <laughs> and that's how I afford an RM. End of story. Yes, go. <laughs> yes. Welcome back to the Digital Social Hour. I'm here with my co-host, Wayne Lewis. What up, what up? And our guest today is Zane Jan. What up? Zane, going, the man? building, Mr. Richard Milley. Mr. Man. RM, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Rich Boy. <laughs> Mr. Richard Milley in the building. First guest with an RM on. Really? Right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm surprised. What? We act like, like they don't a even make thing. a lot of those. Those not even new. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like 5,000 a year. Yeah. I actually got really lucky. So story behind this. Yeah, what's the um, story? I've had RMs before, but mm -hmm. you have to buy them uh, in the gray market because you can't. You can never get something straight through a boutique no, yeah. or through RM directly. Yeah. If you look at Rolex, Rolex makes a million a million watches a year. Mm -hmm. You look at Patek and AP; they make between sixty and seventy thousand a year. Mm -hmm. RM makes four to five thousand a year. They were four thousand up until last year, and then they mm -hmm. bumped it up to five thousand a year. Mm -hmm. So just think about it: a million watches to five thousand. Yeah. So Everyone needed a Rolex over the last year; couldn't even get it directly from Rolex. So mm -hmm. imagine RM. So I got super lucky because I was in Aspen mm. and I was staying in a hotel where they have a Patek store there. Mm. So I went to go talk to the Patek guy. And if you ever walk into a, one of these stores, they are the most rude, arrogant mother in the world mm -hmm. because they know that they have the product and they know that they have the control because right. everyone wants their watch mm -hmm. and everyone wants it at retail price. Mm -hmm. So I walked in there and then, I don't know, he just hit it off with me. He liked me, mm -hmm. which is very, very rare. Right. And then he goes, I don't have a watch for you right now but I have a buddy who works at RM. Let mm. me go and introduce you to him. I heard that he might have something. I'm like, Whoa. okay, this is super rare in Aspen. So I go there, I walk into it, I meet the guy, nothing happens. He's like, no, I don't, I don't have anything for you, blah, blah, blah. Let's <laughs> I don't talk. have anything for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, dude, it's always like that in any watch store. Yeah, it's yeah, pretty yeah. fucked, especially if you want something good. Mm. The only thing they will try to sell you is either a 300K female watch, mm -hmm. which, Number one, you don't want. Number two, dropping 300 on your girl is crazy. Yeah. And then number three, it's not as valuable. Like this watch I can go and sell and I can make money on. Mm -hmm. yeah. On that on that ladies RM, I'm probably gonna lose money on that. Gotcha. Or I can buy a million dollar watch that looks like from RM that mm -hmm. I don't like, yeah. which I'm not gonna do either of those things. So yeah. I told him straight up, I'm like, I'm not gonna spend that money on this watch unless I like it, mm -hmm. okay? No one is spending what people spend on a house for a watch mm -hmm. if they don't like the watch. Right. So I told him that and then we just stayed in good communication for three months and he really liked me for some reason and one day he dropped the watch on me and he was like, I got it and stopped. No way. I have so it, how, much, it how, how, how much you pay for it? I paid 175 for this mm -hmm. and when the market was high up, this was going for around 300 grand. Damn. Yeah. Damn. And then I had another, I had another RM I paid 300 for, but that was uh, not from RM, that was outside. Mm -hmm. And that watch was same thing. That was probably like 140 or 150 directly from Gee, RM. Nice. So as you can see, a lot of RMs trade sometimes twice as much if it's a popular RM nice. market. So let's dive into how you're even affording RMs. <laughs> right, yeah. right, right. Let's yeah. talk solar. How did you get started with solar and how have you scaled your company to be so massive? Yeah, so I uh, got started in solar knocking doors. So mm. um, my background, I grew up in a small town outside of Boston. Right. And a uh, very, very rough place. It's known as one of the highest opioid epidemic mm. regions around wow. the world. Mm -hmm. And I grew up around a lot of people that overdosed on a bunch, mm -hmm. right? So it was just like that place's thing. It was yeah. so bad that you would drive down and outside of CVS and Walgreens, there would be signs. And on those signs, it would say, we do not have in here mm -hmm. because junkies would go in and break into CVS's and Walgreens mm -hmm. all day long. Mm -hmm. So they literally had huge signs outside. That's so also a different city if you wanted them. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, so, wow. so what I did was I'd walk outside and I'd like kick something and be like, Oh, f 
that's a needle on the floor. What's well, that mm-hmm. at four or five years old, yeah, right? Geez. So I grew up in that environment. I grew up in a 500 square foot project. Mm-hmm. Uh, both my parents are immigrants. I'm right. first first uh, generation American. Mm-hmm. And my parents never ever had money. My dad was a taxi driver. Mm-hmm. And my mom worked layaway at Marshall. So mm-hmm. both of them were barely making 25 to 30K a year. Mm-hmm. But I knew that I wanted to be successful. Mm-hmm. I knew that I wanted to get out of that environment. And they always told me, Zane, if you want to be successful, yeah. you have to go to school. There's no way to be successful if you don't go to school. Right. Mm-hmm. So I looked at them and I said, okay, let me go try this school thing. I tried school, I failed. Mm-hmm. Every single class I had, I absolutely miserably failed. In high school? or Every every, every grade, <laughs> every, every level. Dude, I got yeah. so lucky. I went to summer school a bunch too, mm-hmm. like uh, just to move up to the next grade. Yeah. So I would sit there and it wasn't that I was dumb. It was that they would tell me, Zane, you have ADHD. Zane, you have ADD. Mm-hmm. Zane, you're dyslexic. Mm-hmm. And I would go and I would take take these tests mm-hmm. to basically get me prescribed on meds. And I would pass these tests with flying colors. And they'd be like, Zane, <laughs> That's what wrong. the f- going yeah, on? Yeah, yeah. Like, you're acting like you have all these things, but you're going to class and then we're giving you this test and you're passing it. Yeah. And I realized I just wasn't into it. Mm. So fast forward, I turned 14 years old and I started yeah. selling so that nice. Let's go. My first thing, <laughs> and that's how I afford an RM. End of story. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Thank you. Yeah, man, there we go. I got. It's I got you after. Um, no, so I, I started selling, and you know the first thing was weed. Yeah, yeah. So I went. I bought for hundred fifty dollars a bag of mids. Yeah. I went on what was called the MBTA, right? Yeah. So. Uh, it's the Massachusetts Bus Transportation Authority or something like that. Yeah. So I went down to a place called Quincy, Massachusetts, mm-hmm. picked up my first bag, mm-hmm. walked outside. This is a f- straight trap house. Mm-hmm. I remember seeing a gun on it. It was the first time I saw an actual gun. Mm-hmm. He gave me this thing. This guy sold c- everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got him through a friend, his contact. Mm-hmm. I'm walking with a backpack, 14 years old, and I hop onto this bus again. Right. And as I'm hopping on, I'm like, oh, I got to actually go to the bathroom. And there's a pizza hut around the corner. Mm-hmm. So little me, 14 year old with a bag and my lids LA hat mm-hmm. on, I walk in and uh, I see a cop in there at pizza hut. Mm-hmm. And I just start bugging out. I'm freaking out. I'm like, I'm going to get caught. He knows, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. I go to the bathroom. I come out, I walk out and it's like, okay, cool. I'm out. Let me get on this bus and let me get back. Home. Right, right. So I get on this bus. I get back home. I go to my buddy Preston's, mm-hmm. uh, house his brother wanted to buy some Mm -hmm. i sold that to him for i think it was two or 210 Mm -hmm. made 50 60 bucks and i was like okay this is my first play yeah yeah. and that's how i learned economics i was like okay i can buy something at a lower price i can sell it at a higher price right right. fast forward i went from selling that to a full-blown week enterprise Mm -hmm. um then at 16 years old my mom gets hit with a stroke Mm-hmm. She falls to the ground while she's working. She mm-hmm. gets airlifted to Mass General Hospital in Boston. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's where this all happened. So I completely flipped my mind. When my mom got that stroke, I asked the neuro- uh, neurosurgeon, her name was Dr. Du. Mm-hmm. I asked her, I said, why did my mom have a stroke? Mm-hmm. This doesn't make sense. And they go, well, she's healthy. I'm Muslim. I grew up Muslim. So yeah. no drinks for her, no drinking. She's never sipped mm-hmm. a single yeah. ounce of alcohol in her life. Right. Uh, why did this happen? She's not overweight. She's healthy. She's fine. They go stress. Mm. I go, okay, what what would stress be? And I think, and I'm like, it's me and it's money. That's it. So I remember leaving that that uh, ICU unit and I walk into the, into the bathroom mm. and I punch the glass. It absolutely shatters and breaks. I have blood on my hand. I mm. walk outside and I'm like, I'm f- changing this situation. Mm-hmm. So um, at that point, I knew money was a real issue and mm. there was much far greater consequences mm-hmm. than just not being able to have the nicest shoes or the nicest car. Right. It could actually affect your health. Right. So at that point, uh, I just was like, let me study. Mm-hmm. I want to study entrepreneurship. I got every YouTube video out mm-hmm. there. YouTube was just really starting to become a thing. Mm-hmm. I'm reading every book. I'm going through every cycle and I don't, can't really find anything. Mm-hmm. Fast forward 16 to 18, I keep doing my thing hustling. Yeah. Um, I can't get into college because I have a 2.0 GPA and mm-hmm. I can only go to community college and I'm not going to be the fuck bum going to community college. That's a college. great GPA. I, I like 2.0s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I don't want to go to a community yeah. college. I'm just like, dude, I'm going to go. I'm a hustler. Yeah. I'm a yeah. I'm not going to be seen in a community college. I hated that thing because yeah, yeah. everyone around me would, yeah. would do that and I didn't want to be that person. Mm. So... I got, somehow I got into a school with a 3.5 GPA Mm -hmm. average. What I did was I wrote an essay. In the essay, I wrote down my entire story from selling 
the hustle, how I grew up and what happened to my mom. And I pray that there was someone reading that that would accept me because of how crazy of a story it was. Yeah, yeah. I got accepted. Whoa. I get into college at 18 and I get back into the game. I start selling again. Because mm -hmm. um, now all your clients are in class with you. Everybody does judge. So I had, a, I had a full ancillary product kind of setup. What yeah. I did was I would sell you I would then promote you to go to a bar or a nightclub mm -hmm. where I would make money there. Mm -hmm. I'd usually get 10% of gross. I'd work it with these local little small bars. Yeah. And my secret was I would find places that weren't really busy on mm -hmm. certain days. So like Monday, for example, mm -hmm. we had this place called Bobby G's. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was this little bar in Rhode Island. That's mm -hmm. where I went to school. Mm -hmm. And I was like... I went to the to the bartender who was there, right. who was a buddy of mine, right. and I was like, can you talk to the owner, right. and could you negotiate this 10% deal? Mm. Because I could turn Monday into their biggest night ever. Mm -hmm. He goes, okay, it's done. Now, no one would ever give you a 10% off a gross deal where that's, that's insane. That's like usually people's margins. Mm -hmm. um, but Monday, they were like, we got nothing to lose. He's mm -hmm. saying he's going to fill this place up. And that's exactly what I did. I would pack up places mm -hmm. like that. I'd make a big grip of money. And then my third thing was real estate. Mm -hmm. Every single year, people wanted to move off of campus. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to find a house that they could go into with all of their friends and they could throw parties, whether right. it's fraternities or sororities. Mm -hmm. So I got into a little real estate there. So I would sell I do promotions and then I do real estate. Mm -hmm. And that's how I made my first six figures in college mm -hmm. Wow! Um, at 18. And then as I'm making all of this money and this stuff's happening, mm -hmm. I look at myself in the mirror and I go, I'm not proud of Zane Jan. Zane Jan is not a Zane Jan is not an entrepreneur. Zane Jan is a hustler. And mm -hmm. I don't want to be known as a hustler, mm -hmm. right? When you see someone who's a dealer, especially mm -hmm. now when you see someone even just selling yeah. all this weed comes in from California, mm -hmm. it comes in these baggies and it says unicorn on it and you look at it and i'm like someone asks me do i want to sell a, a unicorn mm -hmm. i don't want to be known for that mm -hmm. why because if i go to a dinner and someone asks me what do i do what am i going to say oh i'm a dealer no yeah. that's not cool that's not a legacy right so i looked myself in the mirror and say i need a I need to move on. I need a Richard Millie. I need a, I need a RM. I need a Tiffany. I need <laughs> Tiffany shoes. I need a you can see Millie. right here. Um, yeah. No, no. I, but but I was like, I'm doing drugs every day. I'm doing right. every week. Mm -hmm. I'm doing Xanax every yeah. night. I, I'm taking Adderall. I'm, I'm like a full blown drug addict. I look myself mm -hmm. in the mirror, and everyone's like, "Did you have to go to like a twelve step program?" Mm -hmm. I'm like, no. I looked myself in the mirror, and I said, "Dude, you're being a f mm -hmm. stop." Next day, I stopped. I never wow. touched a cold that. turkey, cold turkey, zero, wow. zero, you know, mm -hmm. having to go back, no fuck draws, just mm -hmm. mentality. And mm -hmm. then I looked at myself and I said, what's my next step? I get a call from a buddy. He goes, Zane, I made $20,000 this week. And I go, USD? And he's like, <laughs> yeah, USD. I'm like, doing what? Knocking doors. I'm like, dude, get the fuck out of here. You're not mm -hmm. knocking doors, making 20 G's in a week. Mm -hmm. He goes, come over, I'll show you. He invites me to dinner in Boston. We sit down. He shows me a $20,000 check. Where I'm from, people bounce checks. So I go, I need to see that go into your account. Mm -hmm. Pulls up his Bank of America, shows me the 20 grand inside of his account. Mm, wow. Just like the Wolf of Wall Street, I look at that and I go, you show me a pay stub, I'm gonna come work for you. <laughs> Dropped out of school, went into the dean's office the next day, said, I'm out. They sold me on this whole plan of coming back and this intervention and whatnot. And I mm -hmm. said, no, I'm out of school. Again, I have two Middle Eastern right. parents, so me leaving college is like insane to Crazy. them. Yeah. This is like their life, but right. I didn't care. I was a rebel. Right. So I went and I did that. I knocked doors at uh, 18 and 19 years old, mm -hmm. essentially. I'm making six figures doing that right. now. So I stopped the hustling completely. No drugs, no partying, all focused on business. Mm -hmm. And I looked at this industry and I go, there is so much potential here. And I watch a video where Warren Buffett says the largest transformation of wealth in history is going to be in the deregulation of energy. And when I looked at the U.S. system, every single home uses the same utility companies. Mm -hmm. When you move into your home, you don't call a utility company and be like, what, what am I going to pick today? No, you go in and they give you a little slip and you call in and you're like, hey, I just moved in. And they're like account number, social security. Mm -hmm. And that's business. Mm. It's a multi-trillion dollar business and they don't have to sell you. Mm. Everything that I knew, I had to sell, I had to knock doors, yeah. I have to persuade people, mm -hmm. I have to do customer service. Mm -hmm. Here, what do they do? Yeah. No, you just call them and they're like, account number. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. I don't want to deal with this. Mm -hmm. So um, I was like, I want to be able to take out the utilities. If you have a big enough enemy and you can go after them and there's market share there mm -hmm. and you have the vehicle, you right. can do it. 
So at 19, I know nothing about the industry. I know nothing about running a business. But you know how to hustle. But I know how to hustle. Yeah. But I know that the vehicle is so big right. that I could actually say the billionaire word. Mm -hmm. Like it's actually possible. Mm -hmm. I'm not just sitting there in la la land. I'm going to become a billionaire selling t-shirts. Like, no, mm -hmm. I have a real thing to do. Mm -hmm. And the industry was growing by two to three X every single year at that mm -hmm. time. So what did I do? I went all in. I burned all my bridges. I told everyone to f off. Mm -hmm. I deleted my entire phone book, mm -hmm. told my parents I'm going to grind. I don't want to talk to anyone. I just want to work. Mm -hmm. And I went on a full blown blitz where I would work seven days a week. I'd wake up at 6 a.m. I do my routine mm -hmm. at 8 a.m. I'm out the door, come back home at 10 p.m. every single day. Mm -hmm. And I just went all in. Wow. That led to a guy coming to me one day and saying, I want to invest in you and I want you to build out my sales team for my solar installation company. Mm -hmm. I go, okay, I'm making great money at this other company, but let me come and work for you and get a piece of equity so that I can build long-term wealth. This is what I'm after. Right. He goes, I have the capital. I have the business experience. I've been doing solar installs for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I know nothing about that. I just know how to sell. Again, mm -hmm. I'm a hustler. Mm -hmm. So he looks at me and he goes, okay, let's do it. Right. I moved to California. First time I've ever been to California from snowy Boston to California. First time I ever moved, uh, uh, even went there or stepped foot was when I moved there. Right. I didn't wow. visit it, nothing like that. I start knocking doors there. I build a team. I get a group of hustlers and I go, we're going to build an unbelievable solar company. Fast forward three and a half years in. In three and a half years, we probably did 60 to 70 million in sales. In three years. Jeez. In uh, three and a half years. But yeah. That's crazy. So we do that. And the owner of the company is like very content with our numbers. And I don't like what he's doing with the money. I don't like his investments. I don't like where we're putting the money and I don't like the vision. Mm -hmm. He wants to pay salespeople the least. He wants to charge customers the highest and he wants to give them a mid-tier product. Right. Mm -hmm. And I didn't believe in that. I thought that that business was failing and it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. So I decided to leave and that's where I'm at today. I left. I started my current company, Better Earth, mm -hmm. less than four years ago. And uh, last year we did $150 million in cash collected revenue. Yeah. This year we're on pace for close to... Four hundred million dollars. Mm. Oh my gosh, that's insane. That's yeah, huge. And that's doing solar install. Everything. So mm. we are fully vertically integrated. So we have six hundred W two employees. We have over three thousand salespeople and seventy one companies that sell through us. So mm. you come into our platform. We have our own sales teams too that are in house. Mm -hmm. Um, and we will take you through our own proprietary software mm -hmm. where we'll design you a proposal. We'll tell a customer exactly what they're going to save using AI in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. We'll build that whole solar system and, you know, on the roof, mm -hmm. show them a whole presentation and get them sold. So all these salespeople across the country come to us mm -hmm. and they say, OK, well, we want you to install our deals. Mm -hmm. They use our software. They go through our system. They give us a contract on that contract. It says my company's name, Better Earth Solar. And then what ends up happening is we go through pulling permits, designs, all that stuff. We get them installed. We write a check to that sales company. Mm -hmm. They pay out their sales rep a commission and they make their spread. So wow. that's really the whole business. And you're using AI, you said? Yeah. So for the proposals. To write the proposals. Yeah. Wow. So, chat, so Using chat? Yeah. yeah well, yeah. I, I use that for all the other stuff. But yeah. our AI specifically, we partner with a company called Aurora Solar. Mm -hmm. And whenever a customer enters in their info, literally in 30 seconds, there is their house with the panels on exactly where it's going to be and a 99.9% .9 accuracy of what that solar system is going to produce for their home and what it's going to save them mm -hmm. for the next 25 years. Whoa, wow, that's insane. So how much on average would you say houses save on solar? Yeah, so it depends what state you're in, right? Okay. Um, so what about here? Like, well, what would be the average monthly cost for? Yeah, exactly. So it depends what you, what what you're looking at. It depends how right. big your house is. In the state of Nevada, you're probably talking about what's called a nine kilowatt system. Mm -hmm. That's probably going to be like somewhere between thirty and thirty five panels on a home, which is mm -hmm. not that big. It's mm -hmm. pretty normal, but. Right. That's what the average would be. You'd have some homes being higher, some homes being lower. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, a customer is probably going to be paying in Nevada two hundred fifty dollars for that power. Mm -hmm. We're going to come and we're going to tell them, we're going to give you one payment. It's going to be two hundred dollars a month, and it will not change for the next twenty five years. And that two hundred dollar payment, mm -hmm. every time you make that payment, mm -hmm. it's going back into your house because you own the system. Mm -hmm. And then, oh wait, the government is giving you a thirty percent federal tax credit mm -hmm. on that forty thousand dollar system. Mm -hmm. So you put zero dollars out of your pocket. The feds are writing you a twelve thousand dollar credit at the end of the year, mm -hmm. and your monthly payment is lower than what you're paying right now. You're gonna wipe out your two hundred fifty dollar bill. Mm -hmm. You're paying two hundred, and you own the damn. Mm -hmm. So when you go to sell your home, 
you're just adding back in the cost that you paid for that solar system into the sale price right. and you're telling the new homeowner you're going to have no electricity bill you're going to be fully solar powered mm -hmm. so in a state like california the savings are a little higher a uh, state like texas they're one to one usually right. and, and same with florida but what's so cool about solar is the utilities have right. never gone down mm. a single year in the last hundred years. Wow. They always go up every year. You look at the Northeast right now, uh, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, mm. Connecticut, yeah. Rhode Island. Last year, they went up 66% That's the utilities. Insane. That's insane. So we're telling you, like, imagine if you were going and getting gas, mm. right? Yeah. And I told you, right now it's $4 a gallon. In 25 years, it's probably going to be... $13 a gallon. Mm -hmm. Imagine if I could lock you in at $4 a gallon for the next 25 years. Mm. That's what people are dealing with. So our pitch is super simple. Right. So let me ask you a question. Um, so that $200 is, is that, that goes towards the down on getting a solar? Cause it's, solar, a, it's a loan payment. So we give you oh. a 25 year loan. Okay. 25 year loan. So yeah. on the $40,000 panels, right? Yeah, correct. Okay. So yeah. that, there is a monthly, but it's not a bill. It's for the panels. Correct. It's owning the panels, but mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're getting all your power from there. Mm -hmm. So you're offsetting your cost of and, the utility and paying company. for the panels. Correct. Because so you're you're already making that same amount of money. You're already <laughs> paying that payment right. towards your utility company. All you're doing is right. redirecting a smaller payment, mm -hmm. but towards owning your system. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there is no electricity bill. It's just you're paying for the loan. Correct. Yeah. There's like a ten dollar fee to stay connected to them. That's about it. Wow. So on your YouTube, one of the quotes you saw that I thought was interesting was a lot of people tell you to live it up in your 20s, mm -hmm. but you have an opposite approach and you think you should live it up in later years. Why do you feel I, that I way? I believe that too. Yeah, because just look at it. If I go out there and I work my ass off right now from the age of 20 all the way to 35, mm -hmm. that's 15 years of my life. If I can build an insane amount of wealth in, the, in that 15 years, what happens for the rest of my life? True. I no longer need to struggle, right? Mm -hmm. I could chill if I want to chill. I could keep going if I want to go. Mm -hmm. But I don't have this noose around my <clears> neck <throat> where it's like, oh, you got to make money today because yeah. you got kids, you got a family, you got mm -hmm. houses. You know, and as you get older, these expenses just go up mm -hmm. and your responsibilities start to increase. Mm -hmm. What happens to a lot of people is, I don't know if you've ever seen that quote where uh, it's, it's like a meme where there's a guy who's digging in a cave and he's like about to hit the gold and then he moves back mm -hmm. because the gold's right there and he's like hitting, he works super hard, he gets so it. close yeah. to it and then he just could have gone a little longer mm -hmm. and that gold is there. Yeah. I believe people put in legitimately like 97% of the work to be successful and they don't go all in to do that extra 3% that would make them even more successful right. and mm -hmm. would set them up for the next 100 years. Right. That's how I look at it. So for me, um, I have a different approach to life. Mm -hmm. I'm an extremist. What I mean by that is I am all into business and life and I have zero goal of ever stopping. Mm, I will never retire way. until the day I die. Yeah, wow. It's way, just yeah. not in my blood. Yeah. And when people look at me and they're like, Zane, what's your goal? I was telling the same thing. I have a hundred year plan. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what I want to do for the next hundred years. And in that hundred year plan, I have very mm -hmm. specific and laid out goals and targets. Mm -hmm. And the day that I die, I want no one to ever even have the ability to say that he could have done more. And I myself, on the day that I die, I don't want to look back at life and say, I should have, I would have. I could have. Mm. That's most people. Right. <clears throat> For me, That's it's fact. completely different. It's straightforward. Yeah. Just I, I want to be the richest person on yeah. planet Earth. Wow. Not because I want the M's in my bank account or the B's or the T's in my bank mm -hmm. account. Because I believe that there are not enough people at the top that are good people mm -hmm. that actually want to make yeah. a change. Wow. And if you want to control the world and you actually want to make a difference, mm -hmm. protesting on a street is not, not going to do it. No. Yelling <laughs> on Instagram is not going to do <laughs> it. Enough. You got to have a seat at the table yeah. and if you want to seat at the table i don't got the connections i don't have a political background i don't have a family in politics i got no one putting me at that table mm. other than money mm. and that's what money is for me it's a resource and it's, it's a, tool. a tool wow so are you married and got any kids and girlfriend yeah yeah so i have a girlfriend <laughs> uh that's kind of just about it but yeah. for me right now my full focus is business gotcha. i just want to build and scale uh, and then my goal is to have 10 kids. So wow. Oh, you, oh, you want 10? Yeah, I want 10 kids. Okay. With the same girl or different? Uh, again, I don't He's think Muslim. one girl is going to put out 10, you know, You're Muslim, 10 right? kids today. Yeah. So you can have up to five wives. Oh, really? Four, yeah. but Four. that's kind of like misconstrued. Very, very rare that you meet a Muslim that actually has that. Yeah, I didn't know that. Um, but for me, it's less about that. It's more about just I want to be able to go out there 
mm. and have kids because I think kids are the most beautiful creatures on planet Earth. Gotcha. Mm. They are the future of our planet. Mm -hmm. And I think right now there's so much bad media and press mm -hmm. going against kids where they're like, oh, the world's overpopulated and this yeah. and that. And what's happening is when my parents were growing up, it was normal for them to have six, seven, eight kids in a family. Mm -hmm. Now people have one or two at most, and a mm -hmm. lot of people don't even have kids. Facts. So yes, population is technically increasing, but what's gonna happen in 100 years? Mm -hmm. 100 years, it's gonna go the other way. Mm -hmm. Every year, that population percentage of increase has continued to go down. Mm -hmm. So more people are being added, but that number gets smaller and smaller and smaller right. every single year. So for me, I want to have kids because I believe kids are the future. Right. And if I could even just have one or two of them that end up doing something that I'm doing mm -hmm. or, you know, can make an impact and a change, I believe mm -hmm. that that's true legacy. So you don't oh, believe yeah. in work-life balance. You just go all in. No, because I look at life as work and work as life. I believe that everything is one. When mm -hmm. I am out there at a dinner with someone or even when I'm in Mykonos partying somewhere or I'm on a yacht in Italy, mm -hmm. what am I doing? I'm working. Why? Because the people that I'm meeting and the connections that I'm building, I'm talking to them, I'm building relationships. Right. And 10 years down the road, that person that I met last summer in Capri, Italy on a yacht, I'm going to do business with him in 10 years. Mm, is it right? a residual effect? Yeah, yeah. So why would I stop? Like people have these stupid boundaries where they're like, I'm going to shut off my phone for a week while I'm on vacation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, dude, maybe <laughs> you can do that. I got 600 plus employees. I got yeah. 3,000 plus salespeople. Yeah, I can't do that. Why would I not answer the phone? It's my job. Right. If an emergency is going on, right? It's literally the same thing as saying, oh, my house is burning on fire, but I'm not working today. So I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to let it burn <laughs> to the fuck out. Right, right, right. No, dude, I'm working 24 seven and mm -hmm. you need a team around you that motivates you mm -hmm. and tells you, Zane, that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's good to work. Right. Work is everything. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people today, I think, have gotten so soft and have gone the other way where they're like, oh, I don't want to work. I need this work-life balance. I need to meditate every single day. <laughs> and it, dude, it's almost turned into a, it is a business at this point. It's a trend. Yeah, people just kind of use it as a, you know, that's one of their reasons why they are or aren't doing things. It's the but. But. Yeah, I'm going to do that. But I have to do this first. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no. And, and I just think a lot of people have that mentality mm -hmm. and it's not that they themselves are lazy or incompetent yeah. um it's that they are being pushed all of this stuff in mm -hmm. their minds through instagram youtube etc mm -hmm. you see all of these gurus right? right and i'm sure you guys have seen this you have this fucker who hops on youtube he's got this little bowl he has this little uh, uh piece of wood and he's going like this in a circle before every single meeting because he thinks that he's aligning the vibes in the room mm -hmm. yeah the uh I've definitely seen it. My G, you think in 1875, this has to go and cow and bring it back to his family. You think he was sitting there in a circle being like, I'm going to align and, my vibe and before I go and hunt. And some in, in, in tribes, though, yeah, that's the actual thing. It's just, sure. They're praying to their gods, whatever their gods. Okay, God but what do they do the other 23 hours of their day? Probably hunt. Fuck, bro. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, work. Yeah. Yeah. There's a tribe in Africa, I forget the name, so mm. I don't want to misquote it, but mm. I had a group of people mm. in my company, they won a competition, mm. and instead of winning a car, you know, I've given out a Lambo before, we've mm. given out tons of Rolexes, we've done tons of cool competitions, mm. they wanted something different. Mm. They wanted an experience in Africa, so we mm. sent them to a tribe. Mm. And this tribe, I, again, I don't want to botch it here, yeah. but they're called, I think it's clockers or clickers or something. Well, you just botched it. But. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Well, their, well, their communication mm. is, yeah. That's how they talk. Yeah, yeah. That's their language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they went to this tribe and they're telling me the stories about this tribe. Mm -hmm. They're like, Zane, we go to this tribe and we're walking with this guy who's hunting and he sees a puddle of water from the rain and he just goes literally all onto the ground and starts licking the puddle like a dog. Mm -hmm. I'm like, holy, mm -hmm. that, that's how that guy gets his water. Yeah. And then they walk and then they see something that they're ready to. They get their bow and arrow and they snipe that thing down. They bring it back and they all cook it and they eat it. And I'm like, oh, how else does it work? Well, a lot of these guys have six, seven, eight wives. Mm -hmm. The translator was translating for them. And one of the guys who lived in the tribe mm -hmm. asked my buddy, uh, he goes, so how many wives do you have? Mm -hmm. And he goes, oh yeah, I only got, I got one. Mm -hmm. And the guy just starts like 
feeling so bad for him like <laughs> oh my god poor guy mm -hmm. he's, he's like well, offering him one of his he's yeah, like you can yeah, take one of mine yeah, yeah, yeah. so these guys they, like they have a completely different mentality yeah, yeah. but what they were telling me was at 18 years old you get circumcised mm. and getting circumcised Wait, that's late right yeah, yeah super late years? everyone gets it when they're born yeah. yeah so at 18 they get circumcised and it's a part of their culture and their religion mm. and what happens is that's what makes you a man that you can get circumcised and you get circumcised in front of a community right so they literally like chopping off a piece of your oh. in front of everyone and you guys want to hear the craziest part they witnessed it no if they cry or complain they get on the spot because oh. you're not a man mm. and you're well, talking about meditating and well, chakras yeah. and aligning your vibes and work-life mm -hmm. balance dude like people need to in my opinion, and this might be blunt, but man, the f mm. like, dude, you guys have a good life. I just did a video with Mr. Beast. It's on the Beast Philanthropy channel. We've mm -hmm. gotten almost 5 million views in the last three days. Nice. Mm. And uh, we went out to Colombia. We went out to a remote island. And in this remote island, they barely have access to electricity. Sometimes they go three to four months without any electricity. Mm -hmm. They have no access to clean water. They shower and bathe inside of the water outside. Mm -hmm. There's no shower or anything like that. They piss and they sh outside in the woods. Mm -hmm. And we had to go there and we had to experience that for a week. So I slept outside mm -hmm. in a f hammock stuck between two trees, yeah. raining on top of us, thunderstorms, yeah. 95 wow. degree weather working out. And what we did was we built them a solar microgrid system. So we oh. put batteries in a solar system. We bought them consistent electricity. Mm -hmm. We powered them up with Wi-Fi because they had like their community phones, mm -hmm. but they have no Wi-Fi or internet or anything. Yeah, so it's not clear. They have to go out on a water. How they actually get to the island is there's this little piece of wood and there's a string attached between two trees across from the island. So mm -hmm. you have your island, you have your bay of water, and then you have this other side, mm -hmm. which brings you to the mainland. They hop on this piece of wood and they pull this string that drives this wood all across to the end. Mm -hmm. That's how they get onto the mainland. They then go and they walk miles. And then I think it's eight or nine miles of walking. And then they have like a little signal mm -hmm. and then they get they go to TikTok and they download every video and they wait there for hours downloading videos. They bring it back to the community and they share it with everyone. That's wow. their source of and education. So we brought them Wi-Fi. We put in this bakery mm -hmm. and we didn't want to be the people that just give the homeless guy a $20 on the street and mm -hmm. move on. Mm -hmm. We didn't just want to give them shit. We wanted to help them solve their problem for the future. Mm -hmm. So on top of building everything, we built a bakery there in like a four to five day period mm -hmm. where they can actually refrigerate their food because now what they do is they walk in the water, they put a net outside, they pick up fish, fish yeah. they and then they eat it. And that's it. Mm -hmm. There's no refrigeration. Mm -hmm. You can't refrigerate your food there. So mm -hmm. you got to eat it on the spot that wow. day. So we built them that whole system, mm -hmm. ovens, refrigerators, all these tools. And now what they're doing, I actually got a text today showing me all the pictures. Mm -hmm. They're baking bread, they're making food there, they're going on the mainland and they're selling it to people and making economy for their entire village. Wow. Yo, that's sick. So is this, the stove is electric, everything's electric. Everything, bro, and it's powered by solar and batteries. Mm -hmm. So they're 24-7, wow. they're completely good and they have that. So you guys talked, so before you guys, they that was they didn't even know what a stove, what a kitchen. Uh, I or, think they know just through like seeing it or hearing oh, okay, it from okay. people, but they don't have that stuff. I mean, they're cooking their stuff on top of fire. You know what I That's mean? Huge. That's insane. How yeah. did you get in touch with Mr. Beast to line that up? So Mr. Beast team actually reached out to a foundation that I'm partnered in. Mm -hmm. So I'm partnered in a foundation called Give Power Foundation. Right. And uh, Mr. Beast's team reached out and they mm -hmm. were like, we do a lot of philanthropy work all over the world, and we know that you guys do these trips. We actually already had this Columbia trip planned, and they're mm -hmm. like, we would love to come on and yeah. film a documentary with you guys. Wow. So it's like, okay, cool. Let's do it. So we go to Columbia. We sit down, and uh, we became really good friends with that entire Mr. Beast team, and now we have two more projects lined up that mm -hmm. we're going to do in the future. That's amazing. But the reason I brought that up was living there for a week you realize how happy these people are and how hard they work. Mm -hmm. The men wake up every single day at 4.30 a.m. and then they go on this little piece of wood and then they go to work in like farms and shit. They come back at 6 p.m. and then when they come back, they work on the island, building stuff, fixing stuff, cleaning stuff all the way until night and then they go to sleep and they do the same thing seven days a week. There's no concept wow. of weekends there. Mm -hmm. There's no Saturday, there's no Sunday. And then I remember we, were, we had a translator there and we're sitting there in mm -hmm. the community and they're asking us about like how the U.S. is, mm -hmm. like what's different. And then I ask them a question. I go, 
do you guys ever want to go to the United States? Mm -hmm. Would you ever want to leave here if you had the opportunity? Mm -hmm. And they all go, no. <laughs> like from what we know, like the United States people are weird. <laughs> like, we read somewhere that they kill themselves. <laughs> and they were so shocked mm -hmm. that in a thing doesn't even cross their path or their mind that someone would ever kill themselves. Wow. So when I look at that, I'm like, mm -hmm. I see how these guys are living. Yeah. They're so happy. They literally, a lot of these men, they have one shoe on. Mm -hmm. The reason they have one shoe on is because they share the other shoe with another person. Mm -hmm. And they usually put it on the shoe that they're going to kick with because they love playing soccer. Mm. Wow. So I look at that and I'm like, I come back here. Someone's like, oh, my Wi-Fi is not good right now. <laughs> I'm like, dude, that bothers me. Mm -hmm. So yeah. really, really good perspective. Man, it's been a blast, Zane. Any uh, closing comments you want to make to the audience? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just if you want to be successful, if you want to take things to the next level, if you want to actually conquer your dreams and your goals, mm -hmm. put in the work. Right. It's as simple as that. I had no connections. I had no money. I had no one telling me, Zane, this is what you have to do. I had no mentors. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to work. Right. And if you put in the work, eventually... God is going to put you in a position to find a vehicle and an opportunity that will make you successful. Always does. Absolutely. Wayne, make sure you guys follow my man Zane. It's a beast. Yeah, follow Zane on IG, guys. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time. Peace. Boom.